Today on The Reality Pill, we have an amazing guest all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil, my very good friend, Octavio Sintra. Octavio is an orthognathic surgeon, that is a surgeon that specializes in movement of the bones on the face as well as the teeth. What I wanted everybody to see is what's possible and what we're missing. So as plastic surgeons, as patients, when we're going through all these different facial treatments, we sometimes miss what the underlying issue is and we try to patch it up with band-aids and do Botox and fillers and all these things that may not ever get us to where we should be or really would need to be. So Dr. Sintra is incredible at restructuring the face internally, meaning with only incisions inside the face. And we're going to show you some of his results on what he's able to do with the infrastructure of the face to better fit and balance the superstructure, meaning the outside part of the face. So it's really an honor to have him here. I've learned so much from him in lectures that I've been as a guest, as a speaker, and I sit there just drooling over his results every single time. So you're going to be excited to see them as well. The thing that we started talking about before that I want patients to understand and doctors to understand is we deal with the soft tissue uh, of the face, which is kind of the cloak or the blanket on top of the face. And then underneath we have the infrastructure, which is the bones. And you have to have a nice balance between the two uh, to really make somebody look pleasant and really nice to look at. And the thing I've seen from you is things that you can't get from a tiny little chin implant. Uh, you can do things like that by moving the bones, but I've seen incredible things with changing the way the teeth sit, the jaw, the cheeks, everything. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to show people some before and afters and kind of get the discussion started that way with you to, to really show everybody what's achievable. The main thing, if you could clarify also, is when we do these surgeries, a lot of people have apprehension because they think they're very gruesome surgeries with long healing times. Uh, mm -hmm. For surgeries like this, w what are you typically looking at in terms of like operating and then uh, healing time? Okay, so uh, before I answer your question, just uh, I'd like to make sure that it's a huge pleasure for being here. And it's always very nice to have that kind of conversation with you because we somehow, we know how we, we, we do our work and how we do our, our brainstorm to plan the phase. And so it's, it's very nice to have the, this opportunity to have this conversation, to have to exchange our experience that, about what we do. Uh, as you said in the beginning, Ben, uh, my intention here is to, to to provide my brainstorm uh, regarding to the face, uh, related to the to the structure, to the bones, to the to the framework of the face, because most of the time when you think to perform soft tissue surgery as a facelift or uh, eyelids or whatever, you are supposing that the structure is in, is in a good position, and you just have to put the or to put or to stretch the skin into the into that structure into the bones. And sometimes that structure is not in a good position. So one thing is from outside to inside, and the other, the opposite, what I do is from my inside to outside. So in this example that, that you are just showing, this girl here is a 20, 21 years old lady, and she came to me refused uh, by an orthodontist, which is the dentist that fixed the bite. Mm -hmm. She was not happy with the face, as you can see in the, in the photo in the middle, with the profile, because she had, uh, at the time, she had a recessive chin because of the size of the AP position of the mandible. So it was not only a bite problem, because the bite, of course, was a class two, where the teeth in the lower jaw, they were more behind where they supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And the orthodontist had that vision that was not only a problem related, related to the to, to, to the bites, to put braces in or aligners and to take the bites in the proper position. So the patient came to me and then we together, me and the orthodontist, we did a plan where the orthodontist put the teeth inside the bones where they belong. What I mean, the lower jaw in the mandible, the lower teeth in the mandible, the upper teeth in the maxilla, in the upper jaw. And then with a single jaw surgery, with a mandible surgery, I moved the mandible forward, correcting the bite, the airway, and the face at the same time, the three, the three pillars. So the, the, the great thing about this for patients who don't understand is 
um, when you're talking about these three pillars, it means that if you look at her ignoring the balance right now, uh, what was done was the teeth were put into better occlusion. So the patient's going to chew better, bite better, function better, mm-hmm. and actually have less of a chance of having TMJ arthropathy exactly. in the future, which she could develop from a bad, from, from poor occlusion. And the airway was actually opened up more, uh, meaning she's at less chance of obstruction and snoring and uh, sleep apnea and those kind of things because the base of the tongue, which can collapse back, was now brought forward because it's attached to the chin exactly. internally. Um, exactly. Externally, when we're looking at her, she went from looking like a baby, which she's adorable. I mean, she's, a, she's not bad looking. Mm-hmm. She just looks like an adorable, cute little baby, but she's 21. Now she looks like a very elegant, beautiful woman. And if you're looking at the balance, it made her nose look better. It made her forehead look better. From the side, you can see it made her lips look better because her lips don't look like they're falling out mm-hmm. anymore. It now looks perfectly balanced with the, the jaw, the nose, the forehead. She has a beautiful curvature because we're shaped kind of like saucers. And uh, she has a nice balance to it now. And it also made her neck look longer without having to do any kind of neck surgery. So you kind of, she looks like she got neck tightening out of it. Now, do you ever have, do you ever have a concern for the opposite happening if you're bringing someone's chin inwards? What is the question? Do you ever worry if you bring someone's chin inwards that you're going to have more laxity? Oh, just the chin. Mm -hmm. If I did it. Like a reduction. Oh, okay. Uh, A reduction of the chin afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I I, I guess I... Do you worry about the neck ever going from this direction to that direction? Oh, okay, yes, of course. So, uh, and uh, first of all, you, you asked me about the, the healing process of that surgery. Mm-hmm. So that surgery, for example, is a, a medical surgery. is a surgery that lasts for about an hour and a half, two hours, and the patient stays in, in, in the hospital for 24, 24 hours only. So the healing process is not that much, so probably five days or seven days, She's going to be ready to go back to the university or to, to work. And of course, that we have to, to stay uh, with the braces in for the use of some elastics. A couple of elastics should be stay uh, for probably four to six weeks mm-hmm. after surgery, where those elastics, they come out for free, for, for the hygiene, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. And related to the other, the other stuff that you just mentioned, um, we always concern about it. It's a kind of a full comprehensive planning. So I always take in consideration those three pillars. So the patient comes to my office re- uh, complaining about the position of the, the chin, that the chin is back, the, the neckline is not good, the support of the lower lip is not appropriate. Mm-hmm. And as you said, she was a very nice lady, but uh, her face had a, a, a convexity when you look to the profile. Mm-hmm. With no definition in the lines. And every, every time that you don't have definitions in the lines of the face and you have a more rounded face, that face tends to, to give gives us a perception of a more uh, infant face. Right. When, you, when you move everything forward and you give more definition to the face, you put more, more self-confidence in that face and also more uh, maturity because the, the definition that comes brings that perception of now of the maturity that you come after growing, after the growing process from childhood to the adult, to, to be a young adult. Um, yeah, she does look more like a woman now. Oh, yes, of course, of course. And also, she, she, she now, she breathes, she breathes, breathes better. She has a stable occlusion, less problems in the TMJ, less problems related to the snoring, and a better face with the contour more balanced face, as you said, mm-hmm. not only in the lower level of the face, but also in the middle third of the face. Because right. with, the, with the mandible back, there's a tension pulling all the soft tissues in the chin and the neck back because the mandible is back. Mm-hmm. When I move the mandible forward, I release that tension in the, in the mask of the face. Yeah. And that tension in the mask of the face comes also in the, in the, in the, in the middle, uh, in the, in the not, not the lower level, the middle level, where the upper lip and the cheekbones, they suffer also from the tendency to the mask that, to go back. Right. And, and this is not a result that you can get with a chin implant. It's, it's... No, no, no way. No, it's not possible because if you do only a chin implant or even, even a genioplasty, 
if you go for a sliding genioplasty, the regular, if you do the cuts and you move the chin forward without the implants, I, I am not a big fan of implants in the face. And, but if, if you move the bone, but only the bone in the chin, not the bone of the whole manual, mm -hmm. first, first thing for the, for the face is not, is not as good because the result is not so natural. Right. The, the result is only, you have a tendency for the mask to go forward only one point not in all of the distribution of the, of the mandible. It's very easy to understand what happens when you move all the mandible forward in the three quarters photo, the photos in the, in the, in the lower level. Mm -hmm. You have a definition in all of the curve of the mandible, the contour of the mandible, because all the mandible, all the structure moved forward, not only the chin. Yeah. If you move on the chin, the support of the lower lip is not natural as well. Right, and it's because, not changing, and the teeth don't come forward to push everything forward with yeah, it. Yeah, the body, mm -hmm. yeah, the body gonna be, will, will not be fixed. The the result, the static result, is not as good. Uh, the lower lip will not have the same support, and you don't have also the benefit of the opening of the airway. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a that, that's a great patient. So this patient. Uh, as well, the the changes that I see that are phenomenal. She 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 went for a rhinoplasty separately, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, but the way the mouth is opening has completely changed. It looks in the lateral photo, right over here. So the profile, uh, it looks as though her mouth is kind of open for. It looks like she's a mouth breather, like she's breathing through her mouth, um, yeah. and it looks like it's underdeveloped. So, yeah. um, yeah. what did she come to you for? Yeah, this lady came, came to my office, referred from the plastic surgeon because she was in the plastic surgeon for a, for a nose job, for a rhinoplasty. And the plastic surgeon did his evaluation about the nose and told her that probably if she accepted to do a genioplasty together with the rhinoplasty, the result of the facial balance is going to be better. Mm -hmm. So she did the rhinoplasty, the nose job, and I, and I put only the chin. This is only chin. This is not the mandible. Is mm -hmm. only two because she didn't have a bite problem at the beginning. So the bite was good, the bite was okay. But if you if you look at the profile photo before surgery, you have a, a kind of a labial incompetence because because of the position of the chin. If the chin is back, you have a traction of the the the, the mask and the mantle muscle mm -hmm. to the back as well. And so you have a tendency to open the mouth, to open the lips when she relaxes, because the lower lip comes back and back and down. When you move the chin forward, that that lower lip you're gonna get, you're gonna have a support that was not possible to to have without it, without that that position. Yeah. So that's why that's why we see now a better uh, lip closure afterwards and mm -hmm. afterwards when you compare pre and post. Yeah, and I try to explain that to a lot of patients during consultation as well, that people with recessed chins like that, they have poor closure of the mouth, poor function of the mentalis, and they end up getting hyper contracture over time because they have to push their chin up like that to, to try to yeah. close things. And they end up getting wrinkles in the chin. The chin ends up getting rounded because it's the muscle is working so hard all the time. Yeah, you see, you see, I see a lot of patients, a lot of patients that they, they have this kind of problem in the chin and mm -hmm. they come to my office and they, they tell me that they are doing for a long time infiltration of Botox yeah. in, the, in the muscle of the chin to right. try to get rid of the wrinkles, to yeah, try to get rid of the decrease. But it, yes, but it's a, it's a muscle strain that is trying, is the muscle, is the mentalist muscle trying to move and the lower lip. Yeah. yeah, to overcompensate, to move the lower lip uh, uh, up and forward. Yeah, and it's, it's not possible. And, and this patient you have didn't a, have to do any kind of orthodontic work. It was just moving the, the actual No, no, at, at that time, she was about to finalize the, the treatment with the liners. So okay. she was about only one, about two months to go. And so, so what do you do when you have a patient from another country? who needs either dental work or orthodontic work, but they want to come to you for the bony work. How do you coordinate that? Yeah, the best way to coordinate when, when the patient needs, when it's only surgery is easier, because when it's only surgery, for example, in this lady, no orthodontics, patients should come to my, to my place for the surgery. For example, uh, rhinoplasty and a chin, the patient should stay here for a couple of weeks. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we do the surgery. The patient stays here for 10 days or 14 days, and she's going to be ready to go back and to fly back. When uh, orthodontic treatment preparation is necessary, the best way to do when patients come from abroad, from abroad is to perform the orthodontic preparation with uh, the use of aligners. Because when you do use the use with the aligners, like, ah, okay. a Invi- like an Invisalign, for example. Right. For example, if you have one patient that you want to you wanna, you wanna send me from LA mm-hmm. and your patient lives there, the patient should come here. We have to do all the full comprehensive treatment planning and perform the planning, in, including the, the orthodontic treatment. With aligners, it's possible to give the box with all the sets of aligners to the patients. Patients go back to LA, use, you have the use of the aligners, the set of the aligners for every week or every two weeks have to replace the pair of aligners. Mm-hmm. And so every, every two weeks or three weeks, we have to do a FaceTime with that patient just to see if the patient is moving in the right direction and is, is taking care uh, accordingly with the orthodontic preparation to get ready for the surgery. And then the patient should come back again only for the surgery. Okay. And it's, so, it's a so, way to perform the preparation without seeing the patient every month. Mm-hmm. With regular braces, the orthodontist should see the patient should follow up in person on the patient every okay. month. Okay, and, and so do you have any way of following the patient digitally with the orthodontist? So let's say they're from Los Angeles and they have their orthodontist in Los Angeles and they're doing the treatment to get the teeth aligned and then come to you. Do you have some sort of digital work that you do together with the orthodontist to make sure yeah. everything's been done properly? Yeah, now, now with, the, with the digital platforms, everything is possible. Without, without that, those digital platforms, it was very, it was very bad to have. It was, it was very difficult, at least, to have that kind of uh, cooperation. Mm-hmm. So in, with the use of digital platforms, we can scan the arches of the patient, the, the, the teeth, and so it's a back and forth. The patient comes to me, I do my, on my side, I, I do the scanning of the arches of the patient, the patient go back to the, to the orthodontist as well. And so if the patient wants to stay there in their place, in his place, and then uh, wait for that collaboration between myself and the orthodontist. The orthodontist only have to do the full protocol with the scanning, photos, mm-hmm. and CBCT, send everything to me through Dropbox, for example, and then I put in my digital platform here, we do the, the planning together, meeting the orthodontist from outside, and so I export that plan to the orthodontist, and she or he is going to be ready to go. Wonderful. So, so let's say this patient over here, it seems like she's got a pretty substantial uh, malocclusion with an underbite and is kind of crossed over to the side as well. And she looks in the after photo to me more balanced, more feminine, uh, and just more kind of delicate overall. So, so what did you do on her to get that to happen? Yeah, that, that lady is a young lady also, as the other ones. And the main complaint was related to the facial asymmetry, as you can see in the pre photos. Mm-hmm. So, with that fair asymmetry, she had at the beginning, she had when she was a teenager, she had, she had a condylar hyperplasia, which is a growing, is a pathogenic, a pathologic growing process inside the TMJ. So, that's why she developed the facial asymmetry. So the main bone coordinates on the facial symmetry. And so uh, the surgery was to correct the bones, both joints. So this, the, that was a bimaxillary surgery, not a single jaw surgery, as in the, mm-hmm. first, in the first lady, in the first patients. It was maxilla and mandible together. And so... Uh, and was that, did, do, do you do maxilla and mandible for, for this kind of movement or for this kind yeah, of movement? So, yeah, yes, exactly. So if I'm doing like my hands, she had a torsion of the mandible and the facial mask to her right side, right? Mm-hmm. So the maxilla and the mandible, they were like this. They were not straight, not even parallel. So they were to the, to the side. So if they go to the side, to the, to the right, the chin goes also to that side and everything moves there. Mm-hmm. So the surgery is to correct both jaws, maxilla and mandible, make them parallel and correcting the facial frame as well. So in that lady also, she wanted to have a better control, control of the face and the back. Yeah. So I did, I did some recontouring the mandibular angles 
where I reduced the, the width of the, the mandible, performing mm -hmm. a, a stratum in the back. Okay. At the angle. So that's why you see that the angles there are more uh, narrow. Right, so, yeah, so now you did upper and lower jaw surgery with gonial angle reduction. What's the healing time on that compared to the other patient? Because she should probably get more swelling, this patient, right? Yeah, so that patient has to stay home for a couple of weeks. So with the first one, one week, and this one, the second one, two weeks. One week okay. more. But still, that's not bad. That's, that's really no, that's pretty bad. rapid recovery for you know a surgery with... Uh, no incisions outside, and I, I think yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's very good. It's very good to know that, that everything is possible to do inside the mouth. So with no scars, no scars visible. Of course, they they happen, but they are inside in the mucosa, and mm -hmm. the healing process inside the mouth is very is very fast, much more faster than the skin. So mm -hmm. if you look to the face, no scars visible, and then. Uh, of course, uh, when the patient is ready to go back to work or to, to go back to school two weeks after surgery, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be okay. Uh, I mean, that the healing process is done. So it's, it's not done in, in two weeks, but it's possible to, to go back to social life. It's, well, it's possible to go back to work. Mm -hmm. I would say that for face, and you know better than me probably, uh, and the face that we have uh, to wait four months, six months to to for the for the for the for the finish of the healing process of the face yeah yeah, yeah so i tell patients for most of my cases it's three weeks to look presentable that means they can get yeah, away yeah, with exactly. like you know some makeup but it's really three months for it to soften up and look nice but uh for everything to fully drain perfectly and function perfectly then it comes after four five six months and then up to a year to mm -hmm. really go back to to its normal resting right. state uh, so, so this. I used to say that I have a kind of a fine tune, and that fine tune will, will take three, four months, not a couple of weeks. Right. And then, of course, that's possible to go back and to to go for the real world right uh, after those couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that all the healing process is is gone in that period. Right, and 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 so what's going on with her bite in the before photo? Does she yeah. have an open bite or uh, is she opening there? No, no, she's opening, and, and I just took that photo when she, she was uh, opening a little bit, just to show that they are not like my it hands tilts. here. They mm -hmm. tilt. Yeah, we used to, to the, the technical term for that is cant. So mm -hmm. it's a cant, it's a cant uh, bite. So okay. when you have this kind of deviation, it's cant. Cant to the right or cant to the left. And so she was see... canted, and now she's, she's not canted anymore. Right, and then when we're looking up at the uh, basal view, or, or sorry, the, the, the aerial view, um, it looks like the jaw has been shifted over and it's more symmetric now and it actually looks like it looks smoother all the way back on both sides. Yes, yes. Yeah, when, when it, it, the nice part to work with the facial frame, with the bones, that is, a, is a, somehow is a kind of a sculpture. So of course that you have to behave and you have to be a, uh, very, uh, we have to give a big attention to the correction of the bite, to the occlusion, to the function of the bite, to the function of the TMJs as well. But afterwards, it's possible when, when it on, not only the movement of the jaws, they are, they are uh, enough to correct the facial frame, we can come afterwards, right, in the same surgery and do some sculpture in yeah. the bones. And then you, you're going to make Oh, well, this patient is very, it's very easy to understand that possibility of the sculpture of the face. Yeah, so, so the form of her face uh, completely changed. It was very, very asymmetric before. Um, yeah. And it looks like she had some asymmetric muscle movement as well. Was that uh, natural for her that she had that? Or, or did she have it from any kind of uh, nerve issue? No, no, not nerve issue. No, not even one. So she, she visited another surgeon. Uh, I don't remember what kind of specialty, but uh, but I know that is a surgeon that she visited before me, and the surgeon told her that she she had a kind of emotional problem in the lower lip. Mm -hmm. So his intention was to to perform some infiltration also with the Botox in one side of the of the the lip to correct and to balance the motion of the lower lip, as you can see in the prefrontal, the mm -hmm. prefrontal when she when she was my. And the only problem, I did nothing related to the nerves. And the, the problem was 
that the insertion of the muscles before surgery, they were, they were inserted in a, in a bone, in a, in a lower jaw, that it was not in the right position. So the function was not good because of that. When I corrected that mango, that was like this, mm -hmm. I corrected the mango and I put it right in the center. I corrected also the insertion of the muscles as well. And so that's why you see the smiling after surgery, the smiling doesn't have that appearance anymore. Right. And With, uh, especially yeah, in the lower lip. Yeah, and, and this is in, incredible because the mouth and the lower face completely changed. She looked asymmetric, a little bit masculine and distorted on the before, on the lower part of the face where it looks like somebody had actually even Photoshopped it. It's, it's stretched so much. Now she looks so clean, uh, symmetric. And this is where I think symmetry really does make a big difference. For most patients who complain about symmetry, I tell them to forget about it. But for <laughs> something like this, it's making a, a huge difference on the appearance of the face, the balance of the smile and the function and the function goes to her dental function where you can see she has an open bite on the right and yeah. uh, afterwards she just has this beautiful pleasant soft straight smile and the facial muscles are balanced now they're they're not straining anymore to compensate for anything did you have to do any botox on this also no there's no, no botox no, on that. no nothing only just surgery amazing. Actually, it's not only not just surgery because that lady, she had everything. And here it's very easy to understand in the, in the CBCT pre-surgery. Pre she had a, a, an active conjugal hyperplasia in the right side. Mm -hmm. So that's why she developed it in the right side. She developed a, a mandibular hyperplasia, not only in the condyle. So that's why the right side, her right side, developed that much. And the height of the ramus is much, much bigger than the left side of the ramus, as where, where you can see in the, in the CBCT. So uh, we did a TMJ. We, somehow we have to stop that process because that process, the process of the conjugal hyperplasia on her was active mm -hmm. in that, at that time. And she was 25, 26 years old. So is, uh, for a 20, 20, 25 years old lady, a growing process is not normal anymore. It's normal when, it, when, she, was, when she was probably 15 or 16, right. you know, 20, 25 years old. So we did it the TMJ to stop that process of the, con, of the mandibular condyle. Mm -hmm. And then after doing the surgery in the TMJ, we go inside the mouth and perform everything in the, in the jaws, in the bones. So, so the, when, when was the orthodontic portion of this done, the braces? What is the role of the orthodontist? When? No, uh, before, uh, actually the preparation for surgery in this case mm -hmm. uh, took one year. Okay, so you, do, you have to do a lot to... Yeah, because, yeah, because the, 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 it's a kind of a brainstorm, and the brainstorm of the orthodontist in surgical patients is like, put the upper teeth where they belong, put the upper teeth in the maxilla, and mm -hmm. now close your eyes to the upper, Open your eyes to the lower and put the lower teeth in the mandible. It doesn't matter. You, you, you don't want to fix the bite. So yeah, actually, it's much more than this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wrong way to try to correct the bite at that moment. Mm -hmm. Because you have to put the, the teeth where they belong. And then the surgeon will put the bones in the right position. And so at the end, you're going to correct at the same time the bite. Yeah. So, so a so... new bite and a new face at the same time. Right. So you'll pretty much take a mold of the upper, a mold of the lower separately, and then ignore the bone around it and place them on top of each other. So you're trying to correct them completely separate from each other, and then later yeah. you're able to put for, the bones where you want them. For example, if the orthodontist try to correct that bite only with braces, probably mm -hmm. the orthodontist are gonna try to, to close that bite in the right side, right? Right. So if the orthodontist closes the right side of the bite, you're gonna have a huge inclination of the lower jaw. Because look at the, look at the bone. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. if you if he moves the lower the lower right teeth upper, so we're gonna have a decompensation a difference much bigger than now in the beginning between the teeth and the bones. Yeah, yeah, and so so I think this is incredible how much you were able to move 
the position of the roots of the teeth, the, the tilt overall, just with doing the Laforts on the upper jaw and then doing the different osteotomies, the asymmetric uh, osteotomies on, on the, the lower jaw. Uh, yeah, that lady was a TMJ, it was a, it was a high condylectomy, is mm -hmm. the name of that surgery in the TMJ. So in the right side was a high condylectomy, and so we did a maxilla, a mandible, and the chin, and the recontour, everything. Wow. And yeah, it's impressive how much her mental foramen on the right side is way out over there, mm -hmm. far away. And now it looks like, you know, you, you look at her after and it looks like the perfect version of where it's supposed to be. Yes. yes yeah, yeah, that's impressive. So, so, so this patient, I think, even more so, it looks like the, the mandible and the chin are just so deficient. And she, again, is unable to close her mouth. Her upper teeth look like they're jutting out. Her lower lip is falling down. And from the front, when you look at her, it looks like everything is just kind of compact and crowded inwards with no definition. And yeah, the, the, distance, the distance of the most forward point of the chin and the neck. You see that the distance, mm -hmm. uh, the, the direction of the line, and also the distance is, is very, very short. And so, as you said before, uh, the mentalis muscle, muscle uh, is trying to move the, the lower limb forward. That is not possible. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's a disruption between the mentalis muscle and the orbicularis, the muscle around the lips. So that's why the, the, we can see now later incompetence. That's why the lower limb is, is, so, is so low. Yeah. Now, with the movement of the mandible, so the, in, this, in this patient, I did the mandible and the chin together. Mm -hmm. So it was only a lower jaw surgery and not, nothing in the upper jaw. So I moved the mandible forward and the chin forward as well. And I feel it makes a huge difference on the character of the face, the expression of the face, where in the photo before, she looks a little tense and she looks a little upset. In the photo after, she looks so much more pleasant and soft. And it feels as though uh, when the facial mask or the skin and the muscles are sitting on a weak skeleton underneath, they have to compensate a lot to try to move or function like they're supposed to. And that leads to a different resting tone where they, they do look a little aggravated or tense beforehand because they're constantly contracting to try to get a normal muscle function. Whereas afterwards, she just looks soft, pleasant, not because she's happier, although I'm sure she is, but she <laughs> looks like a more pleasant, nicer person now. And it's the same yeah. person. Yeah, I guess uh, mainly it's related to that tension in the facial mask. So there's a tension that is, uh, is caused from the size and from the from the position of the bone. And so that's why it's not, of course, as you said, it's not, it's not only physical, it's, it's related also to the self-confidence. Uh, the self mm -hmm. There's a psychological effect of the surgery as well, of course. But uh, if, you, if you close your eyes to the psychological effect of, effect of the surgery and related also to the self-confidence of the patient afterwards, Yep. is related to the tension of the, uh, of the soft tissues when you compare pre and post. We yep. see a lot of tension on the facial mask, a lot of tension in the, in the lips. The lower lip tries to go to the right position and is, is, is not going and uh, is not possible. And now with the new position of the bones, the facial mask doesn't have that tension anymore. Yeah, she looks beautiful now. She looks beautiful now. And uh, this is something that... I see all the time when patients come to me and I try to explain to them that I can't make this better by just adding volume, moving things, lifting things. It's a matter of having a mismatch in the infrastructure and the superstructure of the face and deficiency in certain areas and, and causing imbalance from that. So I, this is something that I could never fix. And you can see internally what a big yeah. difference that is. That's a huge deficiency in the lower jaw where it's sitting yeah. compared to the upper, if you look at that kind of lower view of the teeth. And now you see when she smiles, before when she's smiling, it's a strained smile. Afterwards, when she's smiling, it's a relaxed, pleasant smile. And I see that a lot with lip lifts. Lip lifts, when they have uh, a lip that's too long and they're trying to smile, they're always straining to get up to a nice position because they have to compensate for this longer upper lip. Mm -hmm. And when you do a lip lift, all of a sudden they take a photo and the their smile is more relaxed. They look like a nicer person when they're smiling 
and the mm -hmm. shadows around the nasal labial folds are less deep, just like they are in this photo, because they're not straining as much during during their smile. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, as I said, uh, is a uh, is a kind of a comprehensive comprehensive way of uh, planning where I'm, I always concern about, about the tricolor. So it's the airway, is the bite, and the facial, uh, facial mask, mm -hmm. the aesthetics of the face at the same time. So in those kind of deformities, it's possible to correct everything in just one shot, the face, the airway, and the bite. So that's why we follow that, that uh, protocol in all of them. So yeah. it's very nice also that you commented about the lip lift. Because I, I guess that we can join this moment also to, to make a kind of a short discussion. When those patients, when they need also a lip lift, when you have a facial deformity mm -hmm. that needs orthognatic surgery, and then also is a patient that needs a lip lift. Because we had, we had the discussion before for many, many times when we were in, in another conference in lectures together. And so that's now, I guess, it's very positive to present that kind of idea because I guess that may probably all those people know how expert you are in, in, in lip lift and you are the person that modified the, the technique and have uh, um, uh, so superb results related to that technique. Well, I'm seeing so, so much in Brazil actually now. In Brazil, there's a, a lot of uh, doctors who are adopting the lip lift and more dramatically so now than in the past. And what's nice is the Brazilian surgeons that I've seen are getting excellent results and they're getting better than the doctors in the US. Oh, um, good. A very so I mean, it sounds arrogant. It's because they're following the instructions. They're, they're <laughs> following a very simple set of instructions in a paper. Uh, and from, you know, the, the meetings we've had, whereas the other doctors- They follow they the think, marks and huh? lines. They f they're following the marks and the lines. Yeah, they follow the instructions, it's not nice and easy. <laughs> the other doctors think that all of a sudden, just because lip lifts became popular, it makes it okay to do a lip lift on somebody, where that's not the case. It was feared a feared surgery for 25 plus years for a very good reason. A lot can go wrong with it. And the doctors in the US, they- somehow assume that the increased popularity of lip lift makes it okay to go do the antiquated shit surgery again, just because people want it now. Mm -hmm. The Brazilians aren't doing that. The Brazilians, from everyone that I've seen, because I get tagged in their photos, so I get to see a lot of them, uh -huh. they're all doing the more advanced, newer technique now, and their results are leagues better than what I'm seeing in the US and revising every day. So mm -hmm. it, it's very, very impressive, and they're using it as part of their arsenal now. So when you look at somebody, you know, you don't have to do lip lifts, but you know that it exists. So when you see it long on somebody, or you see that crease that we talk about when you smile that forms, or the harshness in the smile, uh, people know that lip lift's a possibility. And that's why I love showing people this kind of stuff, so they know that this is a possibility. And a plastic surgeon needs to know that there's no way to get this kind of result for us. It's, it's not even close to possible. And every single day we see patients like this, especially in an in injectable practice where people are doing a lot of Botox and fillers. Yeah, this patient more volume, in, right? yeah, and they'll just start adding volume everywhere where realistically, if they've seen this in the back of their mind, they say, oh my God, now I see why this patient has a problem with the look. And it's not the right answer for me to go try to do fillers and Botox or implants, this is somebody who needs restructuring. And when you do it, it completely changes her look, makes her prettier, makes her more balanced, makes her function better and makes her nicer looking. She doesn't mm -hmm. look mean. She doesn't look tense. She looks relaxed and happy now. And the proper surgery does that a lot of the time on patients. Yeah. Uh, it looks more natural, right? Yeah. I, I, I think now she looks softer, more pleasant, more balanced, more harmonious. Like I like yeah, it. I, I used to say to the patients that they have to, they have to look after surgery as a non-surgical patient. Exactly. So if, if you look to that lady after and you don't know her before, probably you, you're going to think that she was like that. Yeah. You have, the you have no idea what was done to her. Same yeah, with her. So, I look at her and she looks like she's never had anything done. Yeah, and when you look yeah, at her face, it's a huge change but she looks like she was never operated on. Yeah, that's right. Because the, the result of when, when, it, when it's possible to deal with an infrastructure in the, in the frame is a concept, is a surgery. 
and is a protocol that comes from inside to outside. And mm -hmm. the response of the facial mask, the response of the soft tissues, they're going to behave according to the new position of the infrastructure. So yeah. that's why it looks natural. That's why it looks as a non-surgical patient. And as a patient goes to, to a surgeon's office and do lots of feelings and lots of stuff in the soft tissue, it's unnatural. So you look to the patient's face and you see that it, it doesn't fit. So it's something strange. Something, something is not natural because yeah. it is, there's a volume in the soft tissue that is too much for that, for that face. Yeah, it's about balancing everything. And I have so many patients that come in and the, what they're asking me is, why does everybody say I have a resting bitch face? Why do they think I look angry when I'm not angry? And I tell them it's from mainly the tone of your muscles. And there's many reasons why the tone of your muscles can change. It could be stress, it could be positioning of the teeth, the jaw, uh, yeah. I, visual issues, vision issues. If people have poor vision and they're not corrected properly, they're also doing this all the time. Uh, these things all contribute to it. Instead of me just Botoxing it, which is a two second thing, I tell mm -hmm. them it's happening because of this. So somebody has, let's say, even normal jaw position, but they have an overbite or they have vertical maxillary excess, um, okay. but the upper and lower jaw position is decent. They're forming that podo orange that we were talking about and the su deep sulcus mentalis because they're always trying to do this and close their mouth. Yeah, they're, they're, they're straining the muscle. They're straining it the whole time. And once they're 20 years old, they start to see it. Once they're 30, it gets deeper. When they're 40, now they have deep marionette lines. They have depression as it's pulling the corner of the mouth down. They have little wrinkles forming here and they have orange peel on their chin with a deep sulcus mentalis, that deep mm -hmm. crease there. And yes, I can do some Botox to soften it, but it's not the proper move. And you know it's not the proper move because when you Botox it properly, you only get a partial correction. You can only do a mm -hmm. little bit. When you fully Botox it, they can't move their mouth anymore and they can't close their mouth. And, and the, the whole purpose, they, they, they lose the function of trying to compensate because the whole time they're compensating by, by doing that. Uh, so I do- Especially, not, especially no patients, right? Yeah, yeah, especially. They, they lose the function very quickly once you Botox them. Yeah, and then, and then also in the old patients, you have the thickness of the skin as well, so they're different. So that, that patient is living probably for a long time with the strain, mm -hmm. with the tension. So yeah. it's, it's not so easy to correct and to, to, to make everything goes back to the right position, only with feelings, only with the, the management of the soft tissues. Yeah, and you can imagine with this patient who has that deficiency in the chin, and the lower lip doesn't have the support, you can tell her, if she didn't do anything, in 10 more years, her soft tissue here would be sitting higher. Mm -hmm. It would be flattened inwards because the muscle starts contracting it inwards. And the lip would look like it's sagging even more. So that's, that's something that you've saved her from that's not going to happen anymore. That, yeah. that compensation over years isn't you, happening. You correct a lot of stuff and you prevent another... another another a lot of problems that will come if you if you don't do it yeah so so we're getting close to the end here we have some questions what do you do if someone's getting a rhinoplasty and orthognathic surgery does it matter to you which one goes first as far as getting the proper balance or is it just more having a discussion with the surgeons so they know what they're going to do so my, my personal opinion is that my patient is both. I always think that orthognathic surgery should be performed before. Mm -hmm. And then the, because the orthognathic surgery, probably you're going to change the full structure of the face. Even if you do only a lower jaw surgery, as you just showed. Mm -hmm. you, you do a lower jaw surgery and it seems that you, that you did some, something in the nose. Because you changed the position of the facial mask, the, the facial mask right. and the tension also. So if the patient needs orthognathic surgery and rhinoplasty, the best way in my view is to do orthognathic surgery, wait for at least six months, and then do the rhinoplasty afterwards. All right. So yeah. in this patient, of course, is uh, it's possible to do together because only a genioplasty, only the chin, is possible to do with the nose together. Ah, okay, because so for smaller it's, cases, it's more, you can do them at the same time. For small cases, yeah, it's possible. But if you have a full case for a bimaxillary surgery, as in that lady with the facial asymmetry, I think it's better to do the orthognathic surgery before and then the rhinoplasty in the second shot. Okay. So another important question. Do you come to the U.S. for surgeries? 
Not for surgeries, only to visit my friends. <laughs> Just to visit <laughs> and teach. Uh, no, I'm not allowed to perform surgeries in the US. I don't have allowance to perform. Only for lectures. Yeah. So here's a question about doing lip lifts in your 20s. For these surgeries, whether it's a lip lift or uh, orthognathic surgery, you know, like we're looking at here, the age is not a predictor as to who's who's going to do well or who can do it. It's a matter of need, necessity. So exactly. uh, it is that. false to think that somebody who is 60 uh, is the only person who needs a lip lift because they've lengthened over time. There's some people who are thicker, longer imbalance from childhood and a lip lift can help them just as much as a rhinoplasty could. And orthognathic surgery is something also that it's not something you wait to do. It's something that gets worse over time if you need it because uh, you're going to have trouble, worse breathing when you sleep, you have worse bite, which leads to different muscle tension in the face and also different stress on the uh, TMJ over time, which can not just uh, change the the function of that, but it can change the actual physical form of your bone, as you saw with that other case that we were looking at. She's mm -hmm. somebody who worsened over time because she had a problem that went uncorrected. Yes, and I, I guess that's very nice to say also, when the patient needs orthognathic surgery and the lip lift also, I think also that the best way is to do the orthognathic surgery before, wait for the healing process of the facial mask, and then afterwards do the lip lift. Yeah, I agree. I like doing the lip lift afterwards because everything settles by that point. And yeah. uh, it's the, the two surgeries that I see the lip position actually change with a little bit uh, is orthognathic surgery when they're doing upper jaw and mm -hmm. rhinoplasty. So rhinoplasty, if they loosen the attachments around the piriform aperture, the lip can actually change a little bit in function and position, especially when the tooth yes. move forward or back. So it's always nice to let that settle. And I usually say after orthognathic, you're probably settled around maybe three, four months, four months, something like that. It's, it's starting to settle where you can predictably do something. Yeah, uh, so it's much more predictable to, to wait. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All and right, then awesome. you just have to focus on the lip on the, on the and everything, yeah. all the rest are going to be in the right position. It's a nice, quick, easy surgery, but with a, a long recovery the way that we do it, which is a, a, a deep plane lift. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all the questions. And I'd say everybody, uh, if you want advice or uh, to go see somebody for orthognathic surgery, uh, Dr. Sintra Octavio, is, he's incredible. He's in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he works with an amazing group of uh, orthodontists and dentists over there as well. Uh, if you want to get in touch with him, you can get in touch with him here. Or uh, how do they reach you on your website? Yeah, so uh, my personal email is Octav my name, Octavio, we see Octavio Sintra at me.com. And my Instagram is Octavio Sintra. So um, uh, it's open, so just can join me wherever you want and just be in touch for anything else. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for your amazing head of knowledge and your incredible results. Thank like, you, Ben. Like, I, I, I'm amazed every time I see them. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. It was, it's a huge pleasure to... to to talk with you as always, and then I hope that we can we can meet in the in the in the new in the near future. In the new future, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what's gonna happen, and then thank you so much for this invitation and for being here too. Yeah, please please invite me to Brazil so I can take a vacation. I don't need to invite you to come. <laughs> I'll be there soon. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the last time. Yeah, perfect. Oh yeah, New Year's. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll tell you, thank you so much.